And it was a million percent, I know this to be true, the universe and my soul conspiring to wake me the fuck up (laughs) to what is my truth and my definition of success. And so, you know, now hopefully your listeners are starting to put the pieces together from the very beginning of this conversation. Because this is my favorite part. (laughs) But you know, like I was terrified. I woke up drenched and bawling my eyes out at 2 a.m. every day and I couldn't get back to sleep. So then by 6.30 in the morning, I'm just putting makeup on and putting all the things, shiny objects on and I'm pretending everything's okay and I'm going back at it and I'm pretending that I'm okay and everything's okay. And you and I are very aligned on mental health advocacy and I was not okay. And I now know that it's okay to not be okay. And I now understand that it's okay to not be okay and ask for help. But I didn't understand any of that Mm. then. And so I was very alone and very tortured. And yet in this very privileged, unbelievably rare position. And that went on for the entire final year I was at Harley and about three to four months in, I could barely cope. I was so exhausted. I wasn't sleeping. Now I'm drinking even more, trying to incapacitate this nightmare that I went to see an integrative medicine doctor who I'd been introduced to through Harley. And I just said, help, please, please help. I don't know where to turn. I don't know who to ask. And I know I don't have the resources to figure this out on my own. And I give myself a lot of credit because I wasn't raised in a family that taught me any of this. We didn't talk about anything. In fact, my parents still don't talk about anything. The fact that I wrote this book and like (laughs) shared my whole heart and soul with the world is like blah to them. But um, What a generational gap though, right? Huge generational gap. And, And I feel, I mean, listen, there's no greater work in the world than having these conversations that you and I and your whole community have. So like moment of gratitude for that. And it was a huge turning point for me. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I remember Dr. Bob was this guy's name. And I said, I was like, Dr. Bob, like, please help me. Like, I I can't function and I don't want people to know I can't function. And so he literally started, he introduced me to a book called Breakfast with Buddha and this idea of monkey brain and the notion or the concept of meditation, which I had never been exposed to before. And that begun this very slow journey to me suddenly getting quiet enough to understand what the nightmare was trying to tell me. And that's when it hit me. So now we're probably five or probably six months into this. And it just, it hit me like a ton of bricks while my eyes were closed. And I was meditating one morning and I saw that what I was seeing in my dream was my dog who had died before I went to Harley And in my nightmare, I'm seeing that he is still alive in a closet, basically malnourished, dying on the floor because I have forgotten about him. He is longing for love and attention and nourishment and all of it. And in that moment when Dr. Bob gave me these tools and I slowed down long enough to pay attention, I understood that Mocha, my dog, was a proxy for my soul. And that changed my whole life and the trajectory of my life to where seven and a half years later, I am having this conversation with you. It changed everything for me. I I love that. I hate that part of the story because the thought of a dog suffering is one of the worst things oh. that I can imagine. But Can you but- imagine? Like, you know why I wasn't sleeping? Because like the idea that I would forget that my fur baby was alive. But then you also go, wait a second, the idea that you would forget that your soul is alive and it's talking to you every day and you're kind of doing the same thing. You're like, go away, go away, stop. I'm not listening, push it down. We're doing the same thing to our souls. 
Yeah. Why do you think that is? I mean, you had climbed to what some people, like I said earlier, would look at and be like, CMO of Harley mm -hmm. Davidson, got our shit together, totally unapproachable, so successful, so much money, so happy, all the motorcycle, you know, all of it. But like inside, you were just slowly dying. Like what yeah. causes that? Because I, I know that feeling. And I know a lot of people that know that feeling, even if they don't understand, they know that feeling. What, yeah. like, is it cultural? Is it this country? Because I know I have a whole, I mean, a whole lot of experience working with European countries, Scandinavian countries. They do their stuff a lot better over there, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. But yeah, I'm yeah, yeah, curious yeah. as someone it's who's traveled the world. Different support system and infrastructure and social system and, and all of that. So it's not to say that some of these same issues don't exist around the world. I think that it's very acute here in the United States and probably to some degree, the United States and Canada. So like North America. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I've learned so many things because obviously that awakening led me on a path to say, I have to take some time. I eventually, I spent about six months laying a foundation to leave Harley because I wanted to leave Harley in a way that felt like it was, it respected the brand. It respected my team. It left everyone in good shape. I was not ready to burn bridges. I, I really wanted this to be a beautiful departure because it kind of felt like my second divorce and I wanted to do it in a very loving way, loving to them and loving to myself and pave this way forward because I didn't know what this was. So, you know, I called the journey my soul sabbatical because I didn't know how to talk about it. I had no idea how to explain that I wasn't going on vacation and I wasn't taking a traditional sabbatical. I was going to reconnect with myself and my soul and really understand like, who am I and what's yeah. going on and what lights me up and how do I define success and what am I without the identity of my corporate career, which is all I had ever been. And a few insights, I mean, many insights have struck me since then. A lot of them are in the book. So you're only going to get the, the sort of uh, highlights version in this conversation. Yeah. However, to answer your question, one of the big ones that hit me is that we are taught, we are handed these societal scripts, whether they come from our parents, our culture, our community, our religion, our peers, whatever it is that say, this is what success looks like. And very often those scripts are like boxes. It's like ticking the boxes. It's the checklist. It's like, well, check the list on these titles and these material goods and this level of income and blah, 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 blah. These accolades, these titles. achievements, yeah. uh, right? So 